Uh, welcome to the year's first event for All Rise, a UWGB Civil Liberties Lecture Series. My name is Nolan Bennett, and I am an assistant professor and pre-law advisor here in Democracy and Justice Studies. Along with Professor Elizabeth Wheat, we are really happy to continue this series, and so I want to thank you for being here. And before I say anything else, on behalf of UWGB, I want to acknowledge the First Nations people who are the original inhabitants of the region. The Ho-Chunk Nation and the Menominee Nation are the first original people of Wisconsin, and both nations have ancient historical and spiritual connections to the land that our institution now resides upon. Today, Wisconsin is home to 12 First Nations communities, including the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, Forest County, Potawatomi, Ojibwe Nation communities, Stockbridge, Muncie Band of the Mohicans, and the Brother Town Indian Nation. We acknowledge the First Nations people of Wisconsin. We would also like to thank the Menard Center for the Study of Institutions and Innovation, who have sponsored this series. Their mission is to promote the study and discussion of civil liberties and related institutions and innovations through scholarly inquiry, educational activities, and community outreach. So again, Professor Wheat and I are just so thrilled to have another great lineup of speakers this semester, including after this, Justice Jill Karofsky coming in just three weeks. So please keep an eye on your email inboxes for more on those future events. And with that, I want to turn things over to Professor Wheat to introduce our speaker for tonight. All right, thank you very much. We would like to wear, welcome Erica Powers. Uh, Erica chairs the Environmental Department at Barnes & Thornburg, where she provides veteran legal counsel regarding regulatory matters involving state and federal environmental agencies, as well as Clean Water Act administrative and judicial litigation advocates to support her clients interests in water quality rulemaking policy and policy development craft strategies to achieve client objectives while maintaining compliance with water quality regulation helps clients contest agency decisions in federal and state courts and defends clients against citizen suits and agency enforcement actions seeking damages and penalties Erica is also a proud graduate of Alma College, currently serving on the Board of Trustees and a graduate of University of Michigan's Law School. And so I will turn it over to Erica and for our guests, please think of questions. And after uh, Erica is talking, we'll have a Q&A period and you can type your questions in and we look forward to hearing from you. Erica, floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, I want to thank Professor Bennett and, and of course, Professor Wheat for inviting me. This is um, a, a pretty exciting, actually. Um, and I am hopeful that you all will ask as many questions as possible since um, uh, monologues are not my forte. Um, I am not a litigator. So um, as Liz mentioned, um, I am a graduate of Alma College, uh, where I ma majored in business administration with an emphasis on finance. Um, I also took lots and lots of math courses, um, an understanding from a, an excellent pre-law advisor that um, uh, as an undergrad wanting to go to law school, you can take pretty much anything you would like. Um, from there, I went to the University of Michigan. Um, I studied, a, a, tried, I tried to, as many environmental law classes as I could. Um, along with, um, uh, you know, quite a few regulatory based classes like tax and trust and estates and those sorts of things that are regulatory driven. Um, and that ha had uh, kind of a particular attraction for me. Um, and uh, I was pr pretty clear from my, you know, second or third year that uh, I wanted to practice in environmental law and I wanted to do that in a private firm setting. Um, you know, there are a lot of choices open for, for folks who uh, are interested in environmental law, but that's the one that kind of fit with my business background and um, helping uh, cl clients uh, achieve compliance with kind of the ever-changing um, regulatory and legal structure was something that, re that really interested me. Um, after law school, I practiced in Detroit for a couple of years um, and then relocated to Chicago, um, where I was with a firm called um, Sun and Shine Nath and Rosenthal, which is now a conglomerate, a uh, huge, I think the largest firm in the, in the world um, called Denton's. Um, and after five years, moved over to my current firm, which is called Barnes and Thornburg. Um, and we, you know, I have colleagues who do anything and everything. Um, we have offices in 22 locations, um, coast to coast and, and Minneapolis to Dallas. Um, so anything my clients need done, I can find a colleague who can do it. Um, so that's one of the benefits of going to a larger firm. 
Um, I, I practiced um, in kind of a broad range of environmental um, issues when I first started, you know, and, and we still encourage younger associates to get experience in, in kind of all media, which is kind of the way we look at environmental law, air, water, land. Um, and I did a lot of, uh, you know, a really broad variety of things for a number of years. Um, and then um, things started to get really active around 1997, 1998 with the Great Lakes Water Quality Initiative. Um, and that was a, you know, a kind of comprehensive effort among the Great Lakes states, um, and Canada was involved as well, to establish better water quality standards and regulations to protect the Great Lakes. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues um, decided to start uh, um, a coalition of regulated parties, um, which include industry, of course, um, but also municipalities and trade organizations and kind of gathered them all together in, um, in a Great Lakes Water Quality Coalition. And um, we were formed originally to address the proposed regulations for protection of the Great Lakes and you know, bring uh, the resources of the regulated community to bear um, and advocate for their interests as the rule um, went through adoption. Um, and from that came what is now called the Federal Water Quality Coalition. Um, and it's a similar but um, more national uh, group of regulated communities, still including um, industrial uh, companies, trade organizations, and quite a few municipalities. And um, since the late 90s, has participated very actively in any kind of um, water quality-based rulemaking at the federal and sometimes the state level. And that includes not only rules that you would see in the Code of Federal Regulations, but also um, uh, any kind of guidance that the, the agency's um, considering putting out as an interpretation of its regulations or kind of other policy development at the federal level. Um, and then cascading down to the state. I have practiced exclusively in the clean water area um, for tw about 25 years. And um, right now, uh, about 85% of my time is focused on municipal wet weather issues. So to give you just a little bit of background about what that means, um, uh, a lot of Midwestern cities in particular, but also cities on the East Coast and the West Coast, um, uh, were built a very long time ago and have um, water and wastewater infrastructure that's very old. So you find uh, you can you know find stories in the media about um, you know the fat burgers that they find in the sewer system and um, some communities have uh, lead pipes um, or cast iron pipes and in some locations we've even seen wooden or brick pipes. Um, so in communities with aging infrastructure, um, especially infrastructure that's underground where people don't see the condition that they're in every day, it can be difficult to raise money to um, perform regular maintenance, um, replacement, uh, rehabilitation activities that's, you know, that are needed to keep their water and wastewater infrastructure functioning um, safely. So, um, and especially with the economic challenges that have faced communities all across the country since, uh, you, know, it, you know, 2008, there were some significant challenges. Now, uh, you know, you can debate whether to call it a recession or not, but, um, uh, you know, communities and their residents are under um, severe economic strain. It's really difficult to um, figure out how you're going to upgrade aging infrastructure like that that's on such a broad scale and that affects so many people um, and, you know, and it affects their drinking water, their, um, their wastewater services and it, everyday life. Um, so uh, maybe 20 years ago, um, the EPA uh, started targeting states that have a lot of communities that built what are called combined sewer systems. So these systems are um, intentionally built um, and it, it, with, with federal funding after approval of designs and everything um, to uh, transport 
uh, stormwater and wastewater in a single pipe to a municipal wastewater treatment facility or publicly owned treatment works. You'll hear folks call, talk about POTWs or WWTPs or lots of acronyms in the environmental world, unfortunately. But what happens in, in those combined systems is when a storm is large enough to fill up the capacity, it will overflow into whatever receiving water um, is nearby, whether that's a, a, a creek, a stream, a lake, a river, you know, um, it could overflow at uh, discrete overflow points. It can also overflow in the system through a manhole into somebody's basement. It could back up. Um, uh, it could um, back up into a, a building um, if the system is surcharged. And um, that can result in that combination of wastewater and stormwater getting in lakes and rivers where, um, you know, fish and wildlife live and where people swim. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that, that's pretty distressing. And, um, uh, you know, there are publications out there called Swimming in Sewage, which, uh, you know, well, maybe a little bit sensationalist, um, it, you know, obviously we don't want um, sewage to enter our waterways untreated. But because of the kind of increasing intensity and frequency of storms that we are seeing um, in the modern era, and because of the age and condition, uh, poor condition of the infrastructure in a lot of communities, um, we're, we see those overflows happen much more frequently. And um, those in almost all instances will violate water quality standards that have been set to control the level of bacteria that are in the water to protect uh, primary contact recreation, which is full immersion, like swimming, um, you know, water skiing, those sorts of things. And also what's called secondary contact recreation, which could be wading to fish or boating, those kinds of activities that would result, that might result in incidental contact with the water. Um, so every state is responsible for setting its own water quality standards to protect uh, recreation. Um, and each state is, is different, um, but all, all states try to protect their waters from, um, you know, excess levels of bacteria that might hurt people if they ingest the water or are otherwise exposed to it. So um, what EPA has done over the last 20 years is bring enforcement actions against communities that have not upgraded their water and wastewater infrastructure enough to be able to meet the water quality standards that are established for their, um, their receiving water. And um, what I typically do is represent a community um, in negotiating the resolution of those um, complaints under the Clean Water Act and any kind of related state laws and regulations. And uh, my role is um, to negotiate with the agencies about what has to be done to get the community back in compliance with water quality standards. And that usually involves um, some combination of increasing the capacity of their wastewater treatment plant and also um, rehabilitating uh, any failing portions of their sewers and um, also adding capacity to the collection system. So bigger, better pipes and newer pipes. Um, and also improving operations so that, it, you know, kind of the increasing load of wet weather that's coming into those systems um, can be handled more easily. So maybe we would um, store it in larger pipes. We might build a tunnel um, that would have both conveyance and storage functions, um, or we might build storage tanks either at a treatment plant or out in the system um, to hold on to storm water and then bleed it back to the plant for treatment when it's not overwhelmed. So there are lots of combinations of technology. Um, we might improve the treatment processes for removal of bacteria, and that includes um, uh, biological treatment and also disinfection with um, either chlorine or UV uh, are pretty popular right now. Um, and all of that goes toward, you know, making sure that any time there's a discharge from a wastewater treatment plant or from anywhere in the, a wastewater collection system, 
that it will not prevent people from recreating in and on the waters. Um, so once we decide what needs to be done to meet water quality standards, then we have to figure out how much it's going to cost and how quickly it has to be done. And, it, you know, because, um, you know, city revenues are based on, they can be based on taxes, um, but they're primarily in most places based on user rates. So um, we have to do an analysis of, of affordability issues to kind of determine how quickly they can get revenue and be able to spend it on, these, on this aging infrastructure while also balancing the other needs of the communities. So, you know, the, the um, kind of range of costs that I've seen for a single community it varies from, say, $50 million up to 3 or $4 billion. You know, depending on if you're looking at a, a very small community or a large metropolitan area. And that has to be balanced with um, the other resources that the community needs, police, fire, schools, the range of social services that are provided to the community and everything else that, the, that um, a, a municipal government is responsible for providing. So it's got to balance all of those kind of competing needs for resources with the need to comply with water quality standards under the Clean Water Act. So we take a look at affordability issues. We, um, you generally start with um, the median household income of a community. So you take a look at where that community compares, uh, you know, with the rest of the country. Sometimes we look at, um, you know, the lowest quintile of folks. So we make sure that we're not overburdening and already economically disadvantaged portion of the community. Um, and, you know, and it's all subject to negotiation. You know, we have to, if we want to propose a, a 20 year schedule or a 30 year schedule, we have to justify it based on what our residents can afford to pay, um, you know, and how we're going to balance the competing interests um, uh, that the community is responsible for providing. So we try to do that and we we'll propose a schedule and that schedule is usually implemented in two ways. One is um, in a federal consent decree. That's usually the primary result of these negotiations. Um, and that consent decree will require the community to develop and implement what's called uh, a CSO or combined sewer overflow long-term control plan. And that will lay out the, the what needs to be done and uh, on the schedule that it needs to be done on. So um, that document is approved by a federal district judge. And, um, and then it's the community's responsibility to implement that. Um, and then the second place that you will see those requirements are in um, its uh, NPDES permit. So National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit which is the permit under the Clean Water Act that would allow a municipal wastewater treatment plant to discharge treated wastewater to its receiving stream. So you, you're, the community's activities in trying to reduce its combined sewer overflows and thereby reduce their bacterial contamination of any receiving water are found in the, the consent decree that's lodged with the court and the permit that's generally issued every five years. So that'll contain, you know, the schedule of activities that a community has to implement to get back into compliance with the Clean Water Act. So, but that's not the whole universe of what happens because um, as Dr. Wheat and I were talking before the class, you know, the theory doesn't survive first contact with implementation. So once a community starts down the path of implementing um, what it's supposed to do, whether that's expanding the capacity of their wastewater treatment plant, digging up and replacing a bunch of pipes, maybe um, doing TV, CCTV monitoring to make sure the condition of pipes they think are okay really is okay. Um, all kinds of activities are required by these things. And, and it, you know, it's a huge schedule of activities in most instances. Um, but what I'm seeing now with a lot of my clients who have their plans well underway and they're making improvements bit by bit um, in accordance with their schedules, they're running into um, a kind of COVID related impacts um, and kind of follow on that we're seeing now in the, in the marketplace. So I have clients who 
can't get fiber optic cable that's needed for the controls of any kind of you know treatment plant operations. They can't get concrete. They can't get steel. They can't get PVC pipe. They can't get ductile iron pipe. And so there's a supply chain problem now, in addition to which um, the mass of construction projects that the, this kind of uh, enforcement action requires, um, you know, means that you've got to have a ready uh, local labor force. And that's a huge challenge right now. So we have a lot of communities who are struggling and can't do what they committed to do on time and are seeing cost increases to the tune of 200 to 300% of original estimates. You know, and you're, under normal circumstances, you would see this with a 20 or 30 year schedule because you can't see that far into the future and any predictions have to be taken with a grain of salt. But these challenges are new and are particularly egregious. Um, uh, you know, that we have communities that can't find contractors to bid on some of their projects. So what you're seeing now is a pattern of um, where you have established consent decrees and plans that have already been approved. You're seeing a lot of communities come back to the government, to the state agencies, to the federal agencies, to the Department of Justice and saying, look, we have feasibility issues because we can't get things constructed in time. We can't get materials. We can't get labor. And we can't afford to do as much as we said we were going to because now everything costs twice as much or three times as much. So that's a large part of my job right now is kind of renegotiating um, uh, those schedules that communities can no longer perform. And from the from the agency perspective, any delay is in a delay is a is an environmental detriment, and they view that as environmental harm. And of course, we want to prevent that happening, just like the agencies do. But we have limited resources, um, so it's it's. It's a difficult, uh, it can be a difficult issue to negotiate. So um, I think that's probably the extent of my, uh, uh, of my ability to give a monologue. Um, I welcome any and all questions um, and I will turn it back over to Dr. Wheat. See, it's fascinating for me. Water law is my favorite. And so I, I'm listening to them like, yes, this is my favorite class in law school, favorite subject to teach. <laughs> And so no, I, I could I could nerd out on this forever. Um, so <laughs> so hopefully we'll get, we'll get some good questions. We'll get some time for students to um, get in some more questions for those students. So Nola, um, Nola and I are both pre law advisors at Green Bay. As you're kind of looking at the legal landscape now, but also thinking back to your time in, in law school, advice that you would get for students as they're considering to going to law school, what are some of the factors that you think it's helpful for them to, to weigh and to kind of be mindful of? That's an excellent question. Um, so I think um, it goes in cycles, right? We're seeing a, a kind of resurgence in attendance at law schools now. Um, where it, it was a little bit of a desert for a while. And um, we're seeing that at the, at the firm perspective because there haven't been enough graduates recently, but I think that's, that's kind of picking up. Um, so law school seems to be more popular now um, than it has been in the last few years. But I, I think, you know, the considerations for folks going to law school, I think depend a lot on um, kind of what career path they think they're on. Um, if they know, um, and, um, you know, where they're looking at law schools. Um, you know, I have a general rule, and of course, this is my opinion, and, and um, you know, everyone's got a different opinion, but my general advice to, like, my son and others who might be considering law school is, you know, if you have great grades and test scores that will get you into, um, you know, a top law school, maybe top 15 top 20 law school, um, then that's, uh, it, then you kind of consider how much it's going to cost you. And for a top school like that, um, if you're aiming at a career that's going to be sufficiently high paying to pay back the loans, I'd say go for it. Um, but there are a lot of um, uh, kind of smaller law schools, maybe not in that kind of top tier that offer really good scholarships if you get good LSAT scores and you have good grades. And so you might be able to avoid some of that cost if you don't really need a degree from those top schools. 
Um, uh, you know, so I think there, there are a lot of law schools out there. There are a lot of law schools that have good environmental programs for folks who are interested in that. Um, but you really have to consider, you know, the career that you're after, how much debt you're going to, uh, you're going to get in um, when you go to law school, and, and also consider the programs that are offered. So, uh, you know, for example, Vermont Law School is one of the top environmental programs in the country, and so that's a real popular one with folks who are interested in environmental law. Um, there are other law schools that specialize in other areas, so that's part of what goes into you know, kind of should I go and if, if so, where? All right, thank you. We have our first question from the audience. The question is, have you worked with communities in which water quality was badly affected by waste disposal or poorly managed landfills? Um, so I have not worked with communities with landfill issues, but waste disposal issues I have. Um, one of the one of the challenges for municipal wastewater treatment is you can't see what's in the pipe before it comes to your treatment plant. Um, and so, you know, for example, one of my kind of small community um, clients um, on a, a Midwestern river had a, um, an industry that dumped a whole cartload of carbamates down the sewer. Um, and the, I did not know what those were before I encountered this issue, but the result was a fish kill. And it was pretty substantial because it deprives fish of oxygen. Um, and so you had a large free flowing river. It, it, the reach was pretty extensive. And, um, you know, we had refrigerator trucks full of dead fish that became evident in uh, the lawsuit. And it was all caused by an industrial user who just did something stupid. Um, so yes, I've, I've seen situations like that. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, for my, from, from my client's perspective, you don't know what's coming until it gets there. And that, and that kind of, um, you know, kind of illegal or illicit discharge can upset the, um, the operations of a wastewater treatment works for the whole community um, for a, huge, a, a long period of time. I and mean, this um, kind of impaired this community's wastewater treatment capabilities for about a month until the plant could get up and running properly again, in addition to the, all the effect on the wildlife. So yeah, that kind of situation can be very challenging. A couple of issues that we've talked about recently, so I'm teaching both environmental policy and environmental law, and we've had a lot of questions and a lot of really good discussions on the cases, the current situation in Jackson, Mississippi, and also in Flint. For cities that are facing that kind of water contamination and water shortage, how do they start with resolving that, and what are some of the relevant laws that they need to consider to comply with? So, um, you know, you, uh, it always goes back to the water, water quality standards and um, in the case of Flint and Jackson, drinking water standards. So those are two different things. One is based in the Clean Water Act and the other is based in the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, and those set uh, the, um, the MCLs or max, minimum contaminant levels that you see in drinking water and then also water quality standards for surface water, the receiving waters, lakes and, and streams. Um, so under those two laws and the state laws that implement them, if the state is your authority, um, you have to look to those laws to determine what, what the quality of the water, the finished drinking water that you have to produce, and the quality of the wastewater effluent that you're allowed to discharge. Um, and, and of course, in the case of Flint, the biggest problem with um, uh, the, the, uh, the biggest threat to human health in that case was interaction of the drinking water with uh, lead pipes that carried that water from the water mains to individual homes and businesses. So, um, in a, you know, as I mentioned, older communities have, can have lead pipes. Um, you know, from the collection system to the, to the smaller pipes that lead into folks' homes. And exposure to um, uh, drinking water can release the lead in those pipes if it's not appropriately treated. Um, so the or, or addition of organophosphates to that can prevent the lead from leaching out of pipes into folks' drinking water. But in the case of Flint, that was not done. 
Um, so that left uh, the lead free to be leached out of those pipes and made it into folks drinking water and that's what created the problems there. So kind of a related question, just in listening to you describe your work, it is so impressive uh, and, and intimidating the amount of information it seems you need to know about infrastructure, about water quality. Uh, how much of your work requires you to work alongside engineers or to have a certain understanding of engineering? And, and, and maybe how do you wrestle with that or accumulate? Did you have a brain for that? <laughs> yeah, anyway. it's... It it's, 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 and that's a very good question. And, um, and this is what I tell folks who are considering, you know, law school and, and careers like this. Um, I don't have a technical background. Um, math is as close as I ever got to anything technical, but, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, a good foundation in um, kind of critical thinking and um, communications really helps. And I have learned so much of, from engineers in my career. There's not a community that I work with that I don't have to, I, I don't get to deal with wastewater engineers, biologists, chemists, geologists, hydrogeologists, um, you know, the, the gamut of um, scientific professionals. Um, and so, and they have taught me over the years that, you know, from a regulated community perspective, what's best in regulations and laws um, has to be based on sound science. Um, and when it's not, that's when it gets problematic. So every community that I work with has a team of technical folks from their wastewater operators and engineers that are, you know, like city employees to um, big consulting firms like AECOM and Arcadis and, and folks like that who work on um, designing and building plants, who work on wastewater treatment and the chemistry of wastewater treatment, um, to biologists who look at water quality in the streams, um, the health, the health of the um, ecologic community in streams, rivers, lakes, et cetera. Um, so there is science in my everyday but it seems to be okay that I don't have a science background myself because we have teams of folks who can provide the knowledge um, that's necessary to support the, the negotiations that I do. We were just talking about the um, Inflation Reduction Act in class this week and all of the of incredible funding that both that statute and, and the last couple have put towards drink, safe drinking water infrastructure along with some of those other policies. And it kind of made me think about sort of big picture, to what extent do you see or your clients see the changes in presidential administrations? Because with the last two, we've had very different beliefs in water contamination and legislative approaches. And I'm curious how much both the presidential level affects the municipalities that you work with, and then also at the municipal leadership level, if they have a change in mayor or city council, mm -hmm. um, do you, how does that kind of affect the work that you're doing and your clients? So that's a good question. At the federal level, um, I, you know, I can, uh, the example is the, the kind of difference between the Trump administration and the Biden administration. Um, there, it's both good and bad, you know, under, under both regimes. Um, under the Trump administration, there was, pro there was less of an emphasis on enforcement. So um, that it, it kind of relieved a little bit of the pressure, but it, you know, the enforcement cases that I worked on didn't, didn't stop for a minute. Um, and with the Biden administration, there's a kind of fresh look at protecting communities, uh, particularly um, economically challenged communities and what, what the government's calling environmental justice issues. Um, and has also made um, a lot more federal funding available for water and wastewater infrastructure. And that's been hugely helpful to, uh, you know, because really when it comes down to it, every consent decree that I negotiate depends on affordability. And the more that the federal government can do to relieve affordability challenges, the more water quality gains are going to be made. Now, on the other hand, there, there can be a little, um, a little bit of kind of reactionary or sensationalism about certain things, um, uh, you know, it, including being realistic about when people are swimming. Um, so, for example, um, you know, one of my clients has a pretty fast flowing river um, uh, 
which um, the NOAA folks have decided is not safe for um, swimming, wading, you know, either primary or secondary recreational contact under certain storm conditions that may, you know, that, that are really dangerous to people's physical safety if they're in the water when the water level is high and it's fast flowing. Um, so, you know, one question that my client in that instance asks is, when we have these huge gully washers that result in those unsafe conditions in our waterways, do we still really need to protect, be protecting those for people who want to swim? You know, when we actually should be arresting people who are swimming under those unsafe circumstances. So there's, there's, uh, you know, there's um, a little bit of uh, give and take in that, but on the federal level, I think my clients generally feel that this administration has been very helpful to them because what they most need are resources and this administration has been providing them. Now, on the local level, um, you know, they say all politics is local, right? So it, you, you can, um, if you make changes in personnel and lose institutional knowledge, that can set you back um, in terms of how you operate your plant, how you get the best uh, treatment efficiency out of a plant, um, you know, where you're citing your um, improvements and that sort of thing. Um, and you also see that, you know, say a local mayor can appoint um, a utility board and that can change the, change the direction of things. Um, you know, if they have different priorities for spending money um, and you overlay a government enforcement action on top of that, you can, you can have some very difficult conversations about what the community's priorities should be when you have the Department of Justice uh, in your back pocket saying, no, you promised you're going to spend the money here, even though you don't think it's a good idea anymore, you signed this commitment and it's enforceable. So um, that can lead to some struggles about um, where a community wants to spend money and thinks is best for its community but has this enforcement commitment um, kind of tying their hands in some circumstances. So um, both federal and local politics can make a big difference to what our communities are able to do. Excellent, we have another question from the audience. I've heard of many cases where runoff from lagoons from farms will go into nearby streams and eventually end up in people's drinking water. However, I feel like I rarely hear of these cases with cow, pig, et cetera, farms compared to those where some big factory is polluting water. Do you happen to know why agriculture affecting drinking water goes somewhat ignored? Is it because it's usually in rural areas, therefore it affects a smaller population of people? You know, um, I think the kind of underlying reason that um, agricultural issues often go unaddressed is because of the, uh, the structure of the Clean Water Act itself. Um, the, the Clean Water Act establishes water quality standards that should apply to every receiving water, whether it's uh, fed by, you know, agricultural runoff or point source discharges from factories. Um, but uh, the Clean Water Act doesn't allow direct regulation of farming activities. Um, those kinds of activities and the runoff from them generally don't require a federal or state permit. So, um, whereas the uh, regulation of factories and municipal treatment plants, et cetera, is direct, uh, regulation of agriculture is indirect. So, you can use persuasion, um, you can use kind of cost sharing agreements, and there, there are many people out there trying to think about creative ways to get um, the farming community and farming operations to help in, um, in you know, solving water quality problems. Um, but the regulation, the Clean Water Act itself is not meant to regulate those activities. So because it's left out of kind of the enforcement capabilities that states and, and EPA have, um, it's, it can be hard to get to. We have another question from one of our international students. Um, they did not specify which country. I think it may be Belarus, um, but I'm not sure on that one. A question is, in our country, we had an issue in 2020 with algae blooms in open water sources that were used for the city's water supply. Have you ever had an issue with the source of water supply and how was it managed? 
So I, I guess the best example that I can give you is uh, it recently here in the States is Lake Erie. Um, so there were, Lake Erie is pretty shallow, um, probably not very fast moving. So you can get stagnant areas where algae um, can grow. Um, in addition, excess nutrients from farming, from wastewater treatment plants, from even from industrial discharges, and typically in the form of nitrogen and phosphorus, can combine to encourage algal growth where we don't want it. Um, and the algae can, does two negative things. One is it can cover the surface of the water and prevent sunlight from getting through. Um, and that can starve, uh, it, it make the, the water stagnant and starve the oxygen that's needed for you know, fish respiration and, and uh, normal plant growth. Um, so that's why you see kind of hypoxic or dead zones in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. Um, and the second thing it can do as far as drinking water is concerned is um, it, it can contribute toxins that make it unsafe uh, uh, to drink water that hasn't been particularly treated for those toxins. Um, and that's what we saw in the, um, in the Toledo area, in the Cleveland areas, they had boil water um, uh, orders for uh, at least some period in the last couple of years. Um, and that can be really challenging for a community because, you know, if you can't get at the underlying source of the excess nutrients, um, then that becomes difficult to control because it depends so much on, you know, the level of nutrients, how quickly the water is moving, um, whether there's adequate sunlight, whether there's um, riparian habitat that either promotes or, or um, can retard algal growth. Um, that's, that kind of thing is really hard to, contr hard to control once it gets going. Um, so the uh, agencies, the state and local agencies, um, along with EPA, have been targeting nutrient reduction strategies. Um, and that's one of the areas, which is a prime example of how kind of overlapping with the Clean Water Act to try and get at agricultural sources that are not readily controlled. Um, so it's a, it's a difficult situation and, you know, if you've seen with the recurring problems in the Gulf of Mexico, it's not one that we have solved. Thank you. We've got a follow-up question here to the really interesting distinction you were drawing uh, with agricultural runoff. Uh, this audience member asks, going back to the agricultural topic, have there been any proposed regulations to try and change the way that agricultural runoff is regulated by the federal or state level? Um, not in terms of changing the Clean Water Act. Um, however, there have been kind of pilot projects and some states that have established um, water quality trading uh, regulations that, that might kind of facilitate nutrient reduction in particular. Um, so for example, some states have said, you know, because, because what we can regulate are point source discharges. Those are discharges from regulated industry, you know, through a pipe to a, to, um, a receiving water. We're going to, what we're going to do is essentially overregulate them relative to their kind of proportionate share to the pollutant loading. So, so that they're incentivized um, to go to um, a farming group, an extension group, uh, you know, whatever agricultural uh, entity might be contributing to that problem and say, look, you can um, change your planting and growing practices um, to reduce the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus and fertilizer that you apply to your land. You can apply it in a more kind of directed way. Um, and you can do that more cheaply than I can treat it in my wastewater. So how about if I, if I pay you a little bit, give you an incentive to institute maybe some more expensive farming practices, um, and that saves me a little, you know, I pay you a little bit, but I save a lot of money because it's really hard for me to get, you know, nitrogen phosphorus, phosphorus discharges really low. Um, so maybe it's more cost effective if I give the farmers incentive to do things differently uh, to cut down on the nitrogen and phosphorus loading. So there have been some, some areas where cooperative agreements like that work. Um, so for example, on the Snake River in Idaho, um, the city of Boise um, 
uh, worked on a cooperative agreement with um, some local farm entities to create a kind of side stream um, treatment, uh, essentially a ditch that would uh, um, biologically treat farm runoff before it gets into the Snake River. And that in turn was the basis for changes to the wastewater treatment plants NPDES permit and um, meant that their reduction didn't have to be quite so much and quite so expensive. So there are those kinds of cooperative efforts, but I have not heard of any effort to start direct regulation of agriculture activities that contribute to water quality problems. One of the recent developments and a topic that we're dealing with, I think a lot in Wisconsin right now as well is with PFAS. And so and the EPA has announced that they're starting the process of developing those standards. And there's mm -hmm. a community of Peshtigo, which is not far away from us here, um, that's had just incredible contamination levels from that. Um, what is your sense of kind of where that regulation is going and how are municipalities preparing both for those regulations or are they testing and developing their own? Right, so at this point, um, PFAS is, is a big problem that is, it's, I don't think anybody has the answer to right now. Um, we don't know what the solution is ultimately going to be. I think all parties can recognize that this is a problem that, that needs to be solved and it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, and one of the huge complications in this is um, the uh, FAA has required airports and other facilities um, to use what's called AFFF in uh, their firefighting foam. Um, and, and, you know, at airports, at industrial facilities, anybody that's regulated uh, for purposes of safety has been required to use materials containing PFAS for their fire suppression training and actual fire suppression in emergency situations. Um, and so because it was something that was required to be used, um, there's, you know, there, there can be a lot of finger pointing about, you know, who's, whose fault is it that PFAS is everywhere, but it's everywhere because one, it was required to be used and two, because it does really cool things. You know, it, you have uh, PFAS makes it possible for all kinds of medical devices to um, safely contain liquids inside and outside the body. Um, and, uh, you know, the um, um, stain master carpet and, and a stain resistant, water resistance, any, any kind of material that needs those qualities probably at one time or another ha was made with PFAS. Now, um, the manufacturer is, has, has been seriously cut down, but the problem is PFAS covers thousands and thousands of different compounds. Some of those I understand from the chemistry folks that I work with are so-called long chain, where the fluorine and chlorine you know, can't be broken. And, and so it might, uh, um, and those are really difficult to deal with. And some, some of those shorter chain are not as persistent in the environment. They don't last for, you know, they call these forever chemicals because of the fluorine chlorine bonds. Um, you know, and some of them are, are not so problematic or maybe not so problematic. So we're talking about targeting this huge number of parameters that we don't have good information about uh, their fate and persistence in the environment or um, their effects on fish, wildlife, or humans even. So um, we, we don't necessarily know what has to be done to keep people and the environment safe yet. Um, and the second big problem is, even if we can uh, identify problematic compounds, what do we do about it? If the fluorine chlorine bonds can't be broken and they can't, and they, it can't be degraded, which may be an open question now, um, there's some research out there that says, you know, you can boil, boil water and with a couple of common household cleaners, you might be able to break those. How you apply that form of treatment in a say municipal wastewater treatment plant it's a, a, a little difficult. Um, so we don't yet know how we can treat it. Um, for municipal, my municipal clients, um, you, uh, the, the typical wastewater treatment involves taking out any solids or sludge that you get in you know, domestic waste. Um, and you would typically either incinerate it or um, 
make sure it's safe and you know the high quantities of nitrogen and phosphorus make it a good fertilizing compound so you might land apply it the problem that we're seeing now is if the PFAS comes out in the solids so it's, it's not in the water so that's great you're not discharging it in the water what do you do with those solids now that you have solids with this compound that that we now know is toxic do you put it in a landfill maybe but then you know every landfill is subject to leachate then you then again you've put it in the land which contaminates the land and you have leachate again water that's recontaminated or if you incinerate those biosolids you send PFAS back up into the air and it comes down somewhere you don't want it to be so you know it's if PFAS is not an element but we're seeing similar problems with it that we see with an element like mercury which it's an element it can't be broken down it's everywhere um, and whereas PFAS is, uh, is of course man-made we still have similar issues we don't know how we're going to get rid of it um, and the game that we're playing right now is to pulling it out of one medium and putting it in another um, so the most promising solution to me is if we can further develop the treatment technologies if we really can find techniques to break down these compounds and break the fluorine chlorine bonds, then maybe we'll be able to deal with it. But we haven't seen wide scale treatability yet. So we've talked a little bit about how the executive branch impacts your work. Uh, we are at the beginning. We're about to start a new docket for the Supreme Court. And I know that the first case they're hearing is a Clean Water Act case that concerns um, from what I understand, whether wetlands are considered navigable waters. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that case going to have any impact on your work? Are there others either on the docket or headed for the Supreme Court? What, what, what do you see as the future of the Supreme Court's ruling and what it means for what you do? So the case that you're talking about is kind of a foundational issue to um, anybody who works in, in the clean water world. Um, and that is, what is the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act itself? Um, so, you know, the, does, does the Clean Water Act govern what happens to a puddle that shows up on my front sidewalk every six months or so, or every time it rains more than two inches? Does it govern um, uh, an ephemeral stream in Arizona that's only wet two days a year? but still serves as habitat for local wildlife and you know and a, and a kind of vibrant uh, um, ecological community um, does it cover a, um, a, a say for a combined animal feeding operation does it cover um, a pit that's been used to store water and waste on that on that property for years um, and at what point um, is an agricultural ditch subject to water quality standards that govern swimming? You know, those, those, those are kind of foundational questions as to the kind of reach and breadth of Clean Water Act regulation. And that's what those cases about wetlands are, are typically about. You know, is the wetland, just because it's a wetland, um, does, does the, the Clean Water Act govern it? Do you have to have a permit to discharge or, or um, otherwise work in on that waterway? Um, and uh, one of the kind of recent cases called Maui County talks about how, um, uh, how groundwater is governed under the Clean Water Act. And there are a lot of um, industries that may directly or indirectly affect groundwater. But the question is, did they need a discharge permit under the Clean Water Act? And that's not entirely clear. Um, and so that that case and these lines of cases about what is the appropriate jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act, it's, it's going to be critical and, you know, may change the face of the regulation entirely. For environmental law guests that are present, you will be briefing that Maui case in a few weeks. So take uh, take notes on that. You may cite Erica as, as a <laughs> source for that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating case. So we're definitely, we, we do about a week, week and a half on the Clean Water Act because it's my favorite. So <laughs> uh, first being the professor writing the syllabus on that one. Uh, so with these, uh, with our events and every All Rise series, we have a yet to come up with a good name game where we will basically ask you for 
a word association. These are not like super deep, complicated questions, um, just kind of fun stuff. And so um, we do not coordinate these ahead of time. I have a theme to mind tonight, which will be fun, uh, but I will have no one go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mine doesn't have a theme. I don't think so. Uh, first, favorite obscure legal term? Race judicata. Nice. <laughs> favorite Scottish bagpipe song? Oh, Scotland the Brave. Excellent, classic. Uh, favorite place in Chicago? Ooh, I would say Leona's, which is a, an Italian restaurant that I have loved for years. Favorite place in Scotland? Um, currently Aberdeen. Um, I'm enjoying it a lot, and that's uh, where my heritage lies in northern Scotland. So um, I'm on a, a kind of voyage of discovery. It's the prettiest castle, too. <laughs> All right, dyeing the Chicago River green, thumbs up or thumbs down? Oh yeah, I love it. It's, um, <laughs> it's, it's so cool to see every year and um, it's sponsored every year by a union and they, um, the union workers take boats out there and these huge vats of dye and it, it's absolutely amazing and vanishes like you would not believe. Awesome. Favorite Scottish movie or actor? Oh, um, I, I'm a fan of Sam Hewen in Outlander. Excellent. <laughs> You're on a desert island and you have one book with you. What is that book? Oh, I like the Patriot's Handbook. That's, that's one of my favorites. And last one, Haggis, yes or no? No, definitely <laughs> not. Um, I, you know, I've, I've had haggis from the kind of upscale uh, white tablecloth restaurants to a uh, sandwich in a cafe on the side of Loch Lomond, and it's all bad. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, with that, uh, we will wrap things up and draw to a close. That was an excellent lightning round. Uh, thank you again so much, Erica, for being our guest. Thank you to those of you who came tonight for your excellent questions. And again, please keep your eyes on your email inbox as we announce future events for the rest of the year. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you.